go over and get us started. There's be lots of time for visiting uh, after the service and in between. Not during the sermon, just you know, please. Well, welcome all to our joyful service of praise and worship this morning at Kaiser Christian Church. God bless you all this morning, this beautiful day. Bless all of you joining us via our live streams. We hope you are doing well this Lord's Day. Let us begin our time of worship together with some music. Poor or despairing, come to be blessed. Hungry or tired, come to be restored. Sorrowing or sighing, come to discover joy. Bring your tired, your poor, share your hopes, your dreams. Embrace your doubts, your fears, come as you are. All are welcome here. Will you pray with me? God of blessings and woes, 
Bless us with your presence this day. Reveal your way forward and guide us in pathways of hope and grace. In your blessed name, amen. come together as 
the body of Christ. We come together knowing that God is in our midst. God who hears our prayers and responds. God who knows us. Who has the whole world in God's hands. That is the God that we pray to. The God. The one with myriad names that we use to try our best to wrap our minds around who and what God is. Creator, the one, Emmanuel, God with us, and so many others. God who knows our hearts, holds not just the infiniteness of all of creation, but also each one of our very souls. The wideness and the focus that we can scarce imagine. The one who has created us to be in relationship with the Almighty, with the infinite. At times we would question our own concerns and desires and fears and joys in comparison with all that God is. But throughout Scripture, in human history with God, we are continuously and repeatedly reminded that God cares for us in the midst of God's infinite scope. We are known. And when we hold that up against all of our concerns and worries and woes, we can be comforted and have a sense of peace. We come together this morning in a time of prayer to release those woes and supplications and thanksgivings into God's hands and to seek that sense of peace, not just for ourselves, not just for one another in this space, but for all people. Let us pray together this morning. God with us, God who holds each one of us so tenderly and at the same moment holds all of creation. God, not of the either or, but of the both and. Hear our prayers. Look into each of our hearts and minds as we know you are wont to do. Hear our thanksgivings and our joys. Hear our fears and our anxieties, our prayers for peace and for healing. Help us to be conduits for your grace, filling up in this space and being poured out into your world that others might know you well. 
might become aware that you know them. For such was the purpose of your Son Jesus coming into our midst to show us that way, that way of love, love beyond our imagining, beyond our finite scope of humanity and individuality, but one that extends in and through us to all the world, to all of creation. May your love be felt here in this time and space and in other places, the places that you send us, that we are called to, people that you put in our paths, Lord, hear our prayers. Be with us this day and all days as we seek ever to follow after you. To be your hands and feet in the world. To go out just as your son Jesus sent out those earliest disciples those whom he first prayed with and walked with. Let us continue our time of worship this morning praying the prayer that Jesus taught them, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
freedom wherever you are and I can see it you're the light in the dark you are you are you are oh there is power when I say your name and I can feel it cause you're breaking the chains you are you to join me in praying God's blessing on our young ones this morning. Lord of all creation, we ask your blessing upon the young people, the children in our lives, in our community. Be with them, God. Be a blessing in their lives. May they know that they are known. Amen. This morning we find ourselves a little farther ahead in the book of Luke. We've skipped ahead from last week in chapter 5 to this week we find ourselves in kind of the middle part of chapter 6. Before we get into the text week, I want to just take a moment and, and summarize what happened, what has happened in Luke's Gospel in the intervening space, because there quite a bit that Jesus has been up to since he called those first disciples. He's been quite busy, mostly doing things that irritate the Pharisees, as he was very wont to do. And so after Jesus calls those first disciples and has visited Simon's house. He finds himself in a position to heal some people, which involves some teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law are there, oftentimes disagreeing with him. They find fault with Jesus engaging in these activities at what is for them inappropriate times. They oftentimes find Jesus healing on the Sabbath, or God forbid, he find his disciples gleaning grain from the fields on the Sabbath. And they say, well, John's disciples don't do that. But each time Jesus meets their criticism and asks them challenging questions in return, as we all know, that is just the most irritating thing, isn't it? Answering a question with a question. But most of all, being challenged in their, up to that point, supreme confidence that their interpretation of things and the way that they saw things was correct. Jesus asked them at times, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to destroy it? To recognize people's hunger or poverty or need for healing? 
on the Sabbath or to disregard it and wait for what would for them be a more appropriate opportunity. And he challenges them in that intervening time and calling those disciples. Well, the text we find ourselves in today, in chapter 6, 17 through 26, we all know uh, about the passage in Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. That's familiar. Right? We know the, or the Beatitudes, right? Well, this is Luke's kind of truncated version of that. Oftentimes called the Sermon on the Plain, where Matthew puts Jesus preaching up on the heights. Luke puts him down on the level ground with the, all the people. See, Luke's perspective and, and scope in telling the gospel story is a little bit different. We'll see the first half of the Sermon on the Plain this week. We'll get to finish up with it next week. Let's start out with the text this morning. We, re we join Jesus after he's been up on the mountain to pray, and he comes down, says he came down with them, the twelve disciples that he has named just previously, or the twelve apostles out of his large group of disciples, the ones whose names we remember. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you who all speak well, when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Now, in, again, in, in contrast to Matthew's Beatitudes, his Sermon on the Mount, Luke's telling is shorter, as we, I'm sure you've noticed, but very much rooted in the present. While in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, it is a list of Blessings. Luke is a bit half and half. He gives four blessings and four woes. We see him start engaging with this interplay of fullness and emptiness, contrasting. people in society. It's interesting to note 
As I said before, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus goes up the mountain to preach. But in Luke's telling, and we know the way Luke is telling his Gospel, he's very much concerned with the here and now for the people. The poor and the hungry. Not in, in a very literal sense, rooted in the present. And so Jesus prepares himself and the disciples up on the mountain in prayer. And they come down to where the people are at. That in itself tells us a lot about Jesus, doesn't it? It's not in contrast to Matthew's telling, but that's part of the reason we have more than one gospel, isn't it? You can't fit even all of who and what Jesus is in the four we have. But they give a pretty broad picture, certainly more than just one could do. So the way Luke tells it, we have this powerful image of Jesus coming down from a mountaintop experience. For, we know that term, right? especially as people of faith, having a mountaintop experience. Think about what this was like for those 12 disciples that Jesus has named out of the, the whole, named as apostles. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot. All of these have had a mountaintop experience and are immediately brought down amidst the people who are clamoring for a touch, a glimpse of Jesus, hoping and trusting that they will be healed. I can't hardly imagine what that moment would have been like. We read it now, and we're sometimes so far removed from the, the visceral reality of such an experience. To us, it's just a story sometimes. A story that has meaning and depth in it, but still we often just or reading it in the comfort of our homes or our, our churches. We have to somehow get into the same headspace as, as those folks were at. We think about our own mountaintop experiences. What were those like for you? What did it feel like to be on that spiritual high? so full that you felt like you couldn't contain it and you just had to rush out and pour it out on somebody. Have you felt like that before? I'm seeing nods. I'm nodding of myself. We all have these stories that are integral to our faith development, our, our spiritual experience, our story of our relationship with God. Times both in large and small ways where God has filled us up. Sometimes our mountaintop experiences are, are at you know, kind of a medium elevation. Sometimes they're in the highest heights. They're all significant for us. They all taught us something and continue to do so. We need lots of them to keep reminding us who and what we are. Reminding us of that importance of being filled and being emptied. Last week I shared about 
the interesting video of Stephen Colbert sharing his faith in a public forum, and and he talked about, and I had seen that first that that week a lot of stories kind of highlighting that and and showcasing that as for as something to take note of. And he was able to express where his comedy and his faith interacted. And, and he talked about finding ways to, to love and to laugh together as a way of, fueled by faith, as a way of combating fear and fear of defeat. And I think those of us as people of faith, and even people who are just still seeking and wondering and questioning, heard in his response a deep spirituality and could sense that he's talking about a relationship with God in that moment. In this last week, I saw numerous criticisms coming out of other places of his response. It wasn't, it wasn't overt enough. He didn't mention the pure gospel. He didn't, it wasn't evangelistic enough. And then I read Jesus' words right here that he wrote, lifted his head up and spoke what feels like directly to his disciples. The scripture tells us, he looked up at his disciples and said, but we know also that there are hundreds if not thousands of other people in that crowd witnessing and hearing. So it's directed at the disciples, but not just for them. He tells them, amongst other things, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And as I read that this morning, I'm reminded of those criticisms from, from Christians around the country of Colbert's response of just being too secular or too general or generic. Like, just love and laugh. But I see Jesus saying something very similar right here. You will laugh. You will be filled with laughter in contrast to your current state of weeping. That is one of the godly rewards indicative of the kingdom of God. We see Luke here engaging the storytelling of what Jesus said and did, and telling it in such a way that It calls into question that, that fullness that we sometimes get that feels like emptiness. You know what I mean? It's that fullness that we, that we gather for ourselves, that where we feel a sense of emptiness or a sense of longing. And even as people of faith, we fall into this trap sometimes where we, we get a little bit lost. We want to fill our lives with this thing or that thing, or say, if we just had more of this, or sometimes it's physical things, sometimes it's just time, then, then everything would be fine. We'd be happy. I think that's partly what Luke is calling into question in his list of woes. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Who are laughing now, you will mourn and weep. Playing with this interchange of fullness and emptiness. Making us question, what are we full of? 
one of the great criticisms we levy against one another has something to say about that, doesn't it? Oh, you're full of fill in the blank. I'll, I'll leave that to your imagination. Usually a, in a negative tense. We don't like what someone's saying or doing. Like They're full of you know what. But we can also use it in the positive sense. Full of grace, full of humility, full of kindness and joy. But those things aren't the things that we really gather for ourselves, are they? Those are things and attributes that we, I won't say possess, but I'll say we steward. That we have to encourage and, and, and hold within ourselves. But they aren't things that we create in ourselves. We, we get humility by, by putting ourselves in in positions where we're vulnerable. You can't go out and take humility from anything or anyone, can you? It has to kind of happen to you. You have to be open to it, but it's a gift. However much we don't often think of it that way. Or gracefulness or kindness. It's something that that we allow ourselves to be filled with, isn't it? It's not a, as tangible or easily taken as some of the other things we try to fill ourselves with. But it's that sort of fullness that, that Luke would have us go after. The example that he shows Jesus giving people. One of the things that's good for us to remember as we wrestle with this text and the rest of Luke is going back to the very beginning of Luke and reminding ourselves of his target audience, or at least the person to whom he writes and addresses this gospel. He writes it to a person named Theophilus. The very beginning of Luke, acknowledging that, as he says, many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed to us from the beginning. With eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. He's writing to this person, most excellent Theophilus, someone who we is presumably a, a well-off, influential person who is themselves wrestling with what they have heard and know about Jesus and his ministry, what has happened, the miraculous events surrounding Jesus' life and his death. Scholars have pointed out that for someone like they think Theophilus was, this last verse of the passage today may be directed particularly at somebody like him. That in verse 22, this contrast between blessed are those who hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man, or woe to you when all speak well of you. For that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. I think Theophilus is one of these who may be stuck in that in between. Which way does he go? For someone like him, if he does 
join the Jesus community. He stands to lose his position, to be one of those as described in verse 22, as a person who has lost their status, that have people who hate them and exclude them and revile them. Someone who has started at a a high position and been brought low. Part of what Luke is talking about here is elements of social upheaval. Telling those who are rich and full and laughing who have taken their fullness from the world that that's the best they're going to get. And those who are struggling and have sense of emptiness and weeping that reward and wholeness and fullness is coming. It's the opposite of what society is telling them. Jesus is coming along saying, this is all going to be flipped on its head. Any wonder that the Pharisees and others in power were upset with him. So we wonder and we ask ourselves as we wrestle with this text and think about what it means and meant for those people first hearing, what it meant for someone like Theophilus to read Luke's explanations of what joining this community of believers would mean as someone who maybe was benefiting from the current social norms and status quo, but is intrigued by this good news from this Son of Man, Jesus Luke wants him to know full well what is he getting himself into? What is he risking? And what does he stand to benefit and be blessed with? As we engage in those same questions ourselves, we wonder what is the challenge here? What, what is the takeaway for us? Are we ones who are hungry or weeping, who are poor now, or are we the others? Are we always one or the other? Probably not. Remembering that Luke was very much concerned with the here and now, the present, the the visceral reality. When we read sort of Beatitudes like this in other places, like Matthew, things are spiritualized a bit more. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Matthew, or or Luke doesn't do that. It's just the, the plain and simple poor. Plain and simple hungry. The weeping. Those who are struggling through life. Seeking some sense of fullness. What is the challenge for us? Where do we fit in to this sermon on the plane? What is Jesus teaching us here? What was Jesus teaching those recently called apostles, those twelve? Taking them immediately down off of that mountaintop into the midst of the people. They didn't just get to ride that euphoric wave 
of the mountaintop experience. They were immediately brought down and poured out for the sake of the poor and those needing healing. More than even Jesus' words that Luke records, Jesus' actions in this event and others taught those apostles who they were and how they were to be. His words directed at them, but not just for them. Imagine being the hungry in the crowd, hearing those words. Those filled with grief in the crowd, hearing those words. Those whom society had oppressed into positions of generational poverty. How they heard Jesus' words and saw his action. These ones who were lifted up came down into their midst. Laid hands on them. I think they learned a lot that day about who God is. Jesus helped them to recognize that the source of all life-giving fullness is that one true God. It is passages like this that make me think about reconsidering what church means. As we think about mountaintop experiences and, and having many of them throughout our lives that, that continue our growing in faith and reminding us of who God is and keeping us connected with God, we think most and firstly about the, the really tall ones, the large peaks that we have scaled, the mission trip experiences, the, the community outreach programs that we've helped start, the houses for habitat that we've participated in the building of, these, these large mountains. But every Sunday we scale the peak of worship together. At least a hilltop experience every Sunday. But how often do we forget to come down off of this lofty peak into the midst of the people? We just keep it for ourselves. Where we we spend so much of our time and energy figuring out how, you know, I had a wonderful experience here. I continue to how do I get how do we get other people up onto the mountain? But when we read this the story After Jesus prayed with those disciples and called the twelve, anointing them, they didn't send runners down into the crowds and, and have them bring up sick people and, and, and haul their bodies up the mountain. They went down, didn't they? We can't get past the, the idea that in, in every generation of Christianity throughout the eons and, and even now, people of faith have, have had the opportunity to, to rethink what it means to be God's church. They've gone through some sense of growth and transformation 
and had to let go of the way we've always done it in the past in order to be stretched into something new and better and different to reach God's people, to come down off the mountain into their midst. I can't help but wonder what that means for us now. What is our opportunity to take these lessons and values from a text like this, talking about what it means to be full and empty and the great and holy source of our fullness, What does it mean for our church to consider and to reconsider what it looks like to be church? Taking this place of fullness, the mountaintop experiences we share here together, and to come down, to go out, take that fullness of God out into the world. We know how we've done it before. We have grieved the ways we are, have been unable to continue to do that work in familiar ways. I think we are on the cusp of this next step of growth and transformation, of considering what God has for us next. I think God is calling us to do that work together. To use our God-given imaginations and resources, the great fullness of faith that we possess, scratch that, that we steward, that we have been gifted with. And in the most positive sense of the term, re-gift it. So that that goodness might continue. It may seem like a daunting task. But it is one, as I've said, the church has gone through many times before. The church now looks very different. Even our disciples' church looks very different than it did in its beginning. And not in a bad way. In a mostly positive sense. We remember who we were and ask God's direction and who we will be. Jesus didn't expect those 12 apostles to stay the same. They weren't called because they were all perfectly formed and filled at that point. As we recognized last week, they were called because of who they could be. So are we. No matter how long we've been a Christian or how long we've been alive, God has things for us to do. Not in just this space, but out there, everywhere else. Amen. Let's continue in our time of worship this morning with our hymn of response, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Good morning. Long ago, people of faith were invited to share their first fruits as an offering of praise and thanksgiving to God. Growing up, perhaps some of you lived in homes where the first portion of each paycheck was designated as an offering to be taken to church each Sunday. There may be some here who continue to make their regular gift to the church as the first of all that is paid whether that's online with a check or actually bringing cash to put in the offering tray. When we make a conscious decision to share some of our finances, creating a habit of giving proportionately and regularly, this becomes a significant way to identify ourselves as people of faith. How we spend our income shows what's vital to us. Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, identifies Jesus as the first fruits of those who have died, the resurrected Jesus, offered back to God as the first of all who are to be raised up. What are your first fruits, and where do you offer them? With joy, let us bring our offerings, clearly indicating the priority we give to Jesus and his church. Let us pray. With gratitude, God, we offer these gifts. You pour, you pour out blessings upon blessing for us. Now we celebrate this opportunity to return a portion of what you give first given us. Accept this offering and help us use these funds to further build up your realm on earth. Amen. In the scripture today, the first half of Jesus' sermon on the plain, having called the twelve apostles in, in prayer on the mountain and come down into the midst of the people to pour out blessings upon them, Luke invites us to consider that experience of fullness and emptiness running theme throughout our Christian faith of being filled up with all good things, with the Holy Spirit, through the power of God, not for our own benefit, not to be held in perpetuity, or even invested so that it might grow, but to be continuously poured out. That somehow in some paradoxical fashion, the the act of being a vessel, of being filled and poured, filled and poured throughout a lifetime of faith somehow engages and enacts some sort of miraculous transformation within us. We are somehow seasoned through that experience, imbued with that same spirit. This is a table we recognize that that miraculous event happens for us. This gift from Christ our Savior where we remember the source of our salvation, the sacrifices made, the lessons teached, or taught them, the mentoring that happens and continues to happen. We also have the visceral experience of being filled and the invitation to be poured out. Will you pray with us this morning? Merciful God, with thanksgiving, we remember that we have been bought at a great cost. We eat this bread and drink this cup together in remembrance of Jesus. And we ask that your continued presence be with us. We are committed to you. We serve you. We serve one another. We serve each other, both far and near. And we ask that you use us daily in your purpose of life. Amen. Amen.
as we come to this table by Christ's imitation and Christ alone, we remember when he gathered with those 12 apostles around the table towards the end of his life on earth and, and them experiencing the coming emptiness would accompany the loss of his presence in their lives. Jesus came and through the breaking of bread and the serving of them, he reminded them that they would not be empty, but would remain full. Even as he had to leave them. Blessed that bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. As a symbol of their fullness. The power of the Holy Spirit. He took the cup And he poured it out to remind them that they would be called to be poured out in the promise of covenant between God and people. Poured out to be forgiveness, to be grace for the world. Called to be filled and sent and poured out. That Last Supper is a visceral reminder to those twelve and to us now of the opportunity for fullness. Not because they came and took the bread for themselves or poured wine into their cups, but because they received it. From Christ our Savior. And so we respond to that same invitation to come and to receive. Not to take communion, but to receive communion with God our Creator and with one another, the body of Christ. Let us join in that communion together this morning. stand together and sing our hymn of benediction.
people of God go in the fullness of God.